Hello, Fast Fam. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Craig Lieberman, and I've been tinkering on cars since 1980. I've owned more than 40 cars in my life. Some were heroes, some were zeros. But never in my wildest dreams would I ever guess that three of my cars would go on to star in a motion picture franchise. My Supra, my GTR, and my Maxima all had starring roles in Universal's Fast and Furious movies. Over the next three years, I'd serve Universal as a technical advisor. I helped choose the cars, procure the parts, oversee their builds, and support both production and post-production. I have some cool stories to tell about what it was like to build these cars and to work with the cast. I was there, on set, in the production meetings, working on cars, hanging with the actors, and consulting on post-production. So follow along as I tell the stories. Let's jump in. Hey everybody, this week I'll be talking about Johnny Tran's S2000. So let's get into it right after the break. Have you ever Googled your name? If you have, you were probably shocked to see some of your personal information floating around for the whole world to see. Every once in a while, I Google myself just for fun. I'm always surprised what kind of things are floating around the internet. It's just creepy that these companies have this information on me. So this is what they do. These data brokers are making money hand over fist by selling your info to robocallers, spammers, and in some cases, much worse. This is why I'm talking about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers who are exposing your information and then submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do that. So let Aura handle all of it for you. Now you can get off of all of those lists. You can try Aura free for two weeks using my link here below, aura.com slash Craig. Aura does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats that you can't even see. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to bother downloading several different apps just to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft, insurance, and even more. You get everything at one affordable price. So let Aura do all the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. First off, this car almost never happened. Why? Well, in the script, if you look at the early script, Johnny Tran was supposed to be Pete Tran and he was going to be driving a Mustang. <laughs> You know me, I like Mustangs. I've had a couple of them. I was not gonna object on that. But I talked it over with my co-technical advisor, RJ Devera. And if you recognize the name RJ Devera, he also played Danny Yamato, the guy who was driving the white Civic before the first race. He was playing Gran Turismo. Both RJ and I agreed that, that Tran should be driving a Japanese car. And since Tran was a bad guy, the car would have to be black. By coincidence, RJ just had a seemingly suitable car for the role. His car was at the time a black S2000, so it fit the character perfect. You might have seen RJ's S2000 in magazines in different colors. That's because he changed the colors often. One time, RJ's S2000 was a chroma flare, blue, and at another time, it was orange. But when we saw the car, it was Berliner black, which is a factory color, and it works out perfect. David Martyr, who was our boss, asked RJ if we could use the car, and he said, yeah. A deal was struck, and we were in luck. RJ was paid $6,400 to use the car, and off we went. At the time, of filming, the S2000 was adorned with a Veilside body kit and a matching wing, and it was fitted with Veilside Andrew mesh racing wheels. It looked perfect, perfect, totally in character. During the car's appearance in the first movie, his S2000 only featured bolt on There was no supercharger, no turbocharger, or anything like that. Just the basic mods, but it didn't matter. <laughs> It had an intake and an exhaust, and I believe some kind of suspension upgrade and not much else. But while the movie showed the car having a nitro system, too soon, Junior. That was not true. <laughs> if you didn't guess, of course this S2000 did not have anywhere near $100,000 under the hood. <laughs> I would like to see that. That would have been a great thing. <laughs> In reality, it was maybe 6,000 or maybe even $8,000 because the car he was racing was not a fire-breathing VR6 VW Jetta. And as you can see, the VW Jetta had a two-liter four-banger 
made it to an automatic transmission, although the Jetta had a nitrous system, it was just for show. So in real life, the S2000 would have smoked the Jetta, and it did on screen. The S2000 had the best graphics in the first movie, if you ask my opinion, and it was a great choice for the Johnny Tran character, and I really liked that car. We really only get to see this car a couple of times, once at Race Wars, and again, when Tran goes to Ted's shop in, earlier in the film. When filming was complete, RJ got his car back, and the car went through several changes, including wheels, paint, and other things. He was a, he loved that S2000. About a year later though, Universal decided to produce a sequel. It was going to be called Too Fast, Too Furious. Again, we were asked to recommend car choices for the actors. One character was named Suki, and while Universal was considering using a Toyota or MRS wide body, it was determined to be too elaborate for a car that would be jumping over a bridge because we're gonna have to fix that and then we'll take too much time and too much money. But David Martyr came up with the idea of using an S2000 again. He made a phone call to our RJ who agreed to sell his S2000 to the production. By this time, RJ's S2000 was orange and fitted with a Novibe supercharger and was now pushing about 350 horsepower. We had five of these cars. RJ's car was the Hero One, AKA called Principal Number One, which was equipped with tow tabs, grip mounts, and a fuel cell and a flamethrower exhaust out the tailpipe. I'll get to that in a minute. The second car was a backup for the Hero One car, designated, no surprise, Hero Number Two. Then we needed a jump car, dedicated jump car. We got one of those. The fourth car was a stunt car for the racing sequence and a Mick Rick car as shown here. I watched these cars get built. We started at Eddie Paul shop in El Segundo, California, and they started with the paint jobs. The S2000s were painted house of color. The paint code is SG114-001 base shimmer and pink. The director, John Singleton, wanted to spice these cars up more, and he turned to his art director, Keith Brian Burns, who worked with an artist simply called Noah. That was the guy's name. I watched this guy do this. He came in with his airbrush equipment, and he just started hand painting it on the, each of the cars. Four cars and he got it all right. It was fantastic to watch. Then we got the bill. It was like $11,000 per car. <laughs> this is before you, the time of wraps and all that kind of stuff. You either hand paint it or airbrush it. That's the way they did it back there 23 years ago. And that's the way it was. Together, these two guys created the iconic graphics that would make this car fit the character to a T. Perfect. No objections. The interiors were spiced up to fit the character. That included getting reupholstered seats, a stereo system, and a full suite of apex gauges and some cool lighting courtesy of the guy over at Auto Indulgence. He did a great job on that car. Then we moved on to Florida for the final touches. Once we got there, I got to witness how they created the flamethrower. It's a little complicated, but here, 20 years after Too Fast and Furious, all you gotta do is call up your tuner and say, can you give me one of those pops and bangs map for my car? <laughs> <laughs> that would have saved them a lot of money, I guess, but here we are. This was a big focus for the director. RJ and I show John Singleton videos from Japan, and they love the fire coming out of the tailpipes during the downshifts and upshifts and all that kind of stuff. With flamethrowers in place, it was time to finish the preparation for the S2000. The biggest thing was gonna be the jump car. The jump car was gonna be equipped with a remote controller system. The challenge of using a remote control system was there was a lot of rigging that we'd have to do, but the biggest thing is the S2000 only comes in a manual transmission. So if they're gonna launch it, you can't just drop the emergency brake. It doesn't work like that. It's got a clutch. So what they did, they put it in second gear, put a device that presses the clutch all the way to the floor, and they just rev it up to red line on the switch on the controller, you press it, and it just pops the clutch, and it's in second gear, so it kind of bogs at first, but it goes all the way up to about 60 miles an hour, which is the perfect speed to go over the ramp. So that's the way they did that. But getting the car to land, it was all about pushing the clutch in again and hitting it on the brake, but it worked perfectly. They took their time, and it was a fascinating thing to watch them build. And at the end, when the car jumped, we were watching there, and I said, how far this car is gonna go? <laughs> but they nailed it, man. But that was one of the greatest scenes in the first two movies, I gotta tell you. So everything came together thanks to people like Tim Woods and his colleagues, not to mention the special effects guys, Eddie Paul's guys, and while the S2000 got a couple of minutes of screen time, the reborn Suki S2000 was a big hit with audiences. I saw the movie in the theater and people clapped. It was fun. So what happened to these cars after Too Fast and Furious? Well, the Hero One car was sold to George Barris, who loved to buy movie cars and then claimed that he built them for the movie. <laughs> but that happened shortly after production of Too Fast and Furious. Barris sent it back to my boss, Ted Mosier, to restore the car. He got it all 
cleaned up and all that kind of stuff. But after 2003, there was no talk about Fast and Furious movies. It was done. They had two movies, that's the end, nothing was going on. So when people in the United States lost interest in the Fast and Furious movies by about 2005, this car was sold at a Bonham auction for $24,150. That's cheap now, that car would go for over six figures. One of these cars now belongs to the guy who bought my Hero 1 Supra. The Mick Rig car is gone, surely sitting in somebody's shop or a warehouse or just discarded so we'll never see that car again. It was never registered after the movie. There are two S2000s that are unaccounted for and we may never know where these cars are. So if you know somebody who has one of these cars, drop me a line below or DM me in Instagram. Nevertheless, the S2000 got its 10 minutes of fame and in the process made an indelible impression upon global audiences. So it was a great, great ride. Hey, thanks again for watching. Please like and subscribe. Doing that helps my YouTube channel with the algorithm. And I thank you for doing this. I picked up about 10,000 new subscribers this month, all thanks to you people. And if you have any further question that you want to get them answered faster, go to my Instagram and DM. I answer every DM if I can, okay? But next week, I got a treat for you. I will be sharing you the unedited sound files for many of the main cars in the first two movies. You'll hear the Supra, the Maxima, the Eclipse, and we'll have a whole discussion about that. Why did they use what files for what cars, why the sounds aren't right for the cars. I will go over all of that next week. We'll see you then. Thanks again. Take care.